The COVID-19 pandemic has proven the need to build a vibrant health system across Africa. Its inadequacies are clear. There are only 1.3 skilled health workers per thousand people in Africa, grossly under the World Health Organization minimum target of 2.3 per thousand. Africa has limited manufacturing capacity. Only 30 to 40% of the demand is locally produced. Local vaccine production capacities address less than 1% of the local demand and value. 80% of the total production is concentrated in eight countries. This poses a threat to health sovereignty in the midst of protectionist behaviors and limited global exports of essential drugs and vaccines at a time of urgent need. Welcome to the 2021 Knowledge Event. Building Africa's Healthcare Defense System. The pandemic crisis is a real opportunity to revitalize the African pharmaceutical industry and increase the continent's health sovereignty. The pandemic is also an opportunity to re-examine health financing in Africa. Increased health investments are needed in physical infrastructure, workforce, medical products, service delivery, governance, and information and data systems. The market is attractive for investments in pharmaceutical manufacturing, and there is a strong need and a real opportunity to grow and upscale the local pharmaceutical manufacturing industry in Africa for public health, strategic, and economic imperatives. Now is the time to recognize opportunities and prioritize investments to achieve a strong and resilient African healthcare system. Mesdames et messieurs, bonjour. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our knowledge event on building Africa's healthcare defense system, part of the African Development Bank's annual meeting. My name is Anne-Marie Diaz-Borges, and I am delighted to be your host today. The COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the need to build a more robust healthcare system across Africa in order to effectively address endemic diseases and strengthen the continent's capacity to contain future outbreaks. Pre-COVID-19, the continent's healthcare system was said to be the weakest in the world, especially sub-Saharan Africa, where health expenditure as a percentage of GDP averaged just a little over 5% in 2018, the lowest globally, in fact. Today, we are determined to stem the tide and ultimately find solutions to reduce the vulnerability of the continent's healthcare systems which has been exposed since the outbreak of the COVID pandemic last year. During this knowledge event, we will discuss how to rebuild those systems for greater healthcare security and ensure resilience to future outbreaks. In other words, what does it take to build Africa's healthcare defense system? And to kickstart our session, let's go to Abidjan, to the African Development Bank Group's headquarters to welcome President Akimumi Adeshina. Bonjour, Monsieur le Président. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, I'm Anne-Marie. How are you? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our knowledge event, Building Africa's Healthcare Defense System. We are really excited to have joining us today my dear brother and friend, Dr. Jim Kim, former president of the World Bank one of the foremost global leaders on public health. It is great to see you again, Jim. We are also delighted to have with us today, Dr. Majdiso Mweti, the Regional Director of Africa for the World Health Organization, as well as Dr. John Kengasson, the Director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I am delighted that we are joined as well by James Scriven, the CEO of IDB Invest of the Inter-American Development Bank. We look forward to learning from your experience as a sister multilateral development bank. The situation with Africa's healthcare is extremely troubling. Access to healthcare 
on the continent is extremely poor. Talk less of quality health care, a luxury enjoyed in developed countries. If you are sick in Africa, you need prayers, a lot of prayers. Health facilities, when they exist, are several kilometers away for many Africans. Only 51% of the public health facilities have basic water and sanitation. And electricity, it's available only in 33% of the healthcare facilities. The state of health care infrastructure in Africa is appalling. Just think of the numbers. Africa has 21% of the hospital bed density by 1,000 people compared to Europe. Diagnostic infrastructure in Africa is poor with a magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, available per 1,000 people in Africa, being 46% of that in India, and only 2% of what is available in the United States of America. Africa has 200% more deaths after surgery than the global average. The rich who can afford to are paying their way to get access to quality healthcare services outside the continent. As a result, Africa loses $1 billion per year in medical tourism, draining scarce foreign exchange. Things had not improved by the time COVID-19 struck. At the start of the pandemic, only two countries in Africa had diagnostic facilities to handle testing for the virus. While vaccines have become available, developed countries have stockpiled, leaving Africa without access to vaccines. Today, only 1% of the population of Africa have been vaccinated. That is simply because Africa produces less than 1% of its vaccine needs. The continent is completely dependent on external supply chains. Africa is also overly dependent on imports of therapeutic drugs, importing 60 to 70% of its pharmaceutical drugs compared to only 12, about 20% in India and China. With vaccine nationalism, restrictions of exports of critical life-saving drugs the prioritization of Africa's needs by global supply chains, on timeliness of supply and limited access, Africa has become extremely vulnerable in the face of health shocks or pandemics. The lives of 1.2 billion people in Africa are at risk. Africa therefore urgently needs a healthcare defense system. Building Africa's healthcare defense system can be achieved by giving priority to three critical areas. First, look at production of vaccines on the continent. Second, developing Africa's pharmaceutical manufacturing capacity. Third, building quality healthcare infrastructure. Africa must upscale existing manufacturing capacities of local manufacturers of vaccines and pharmaceutical products. Attract global companies to locate production facilities in Africa. Invest in technology transfer, expand financing for research and development, and establish an Africa medicine agency for safety standards and quality control. Africa must revamp the quality of its healthcare infrastructure, reduce last mile access to primary healthcare, modernize secondary and tertiary healthcare infrastructure, expand diagnostic infrastructure, and build digitally enabled health service delivery networks. Then we must give hope to the poor 
the vulnerable by ensuring that every African, regardless of their income level, gets access to quality health care, as well as health insurance and social protection. It is time to secure the lives of Africans. After all, all lives matter. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much. The African Development Bank Group is determined to involve the next generations of Africans in our discussions. So let's hear now what some of them think about the importance of the topic being discussed today. A resilient healthcare system in Africa is the only way, unfortunately, we're going to survive. In the wake of crises like coronavirus and other diseases and other disasters that are ravaging the continent and the world at large, we Africans cannot afford to have a healthcare system stall because we're already um, combating other diseases like HIV, AIDS, Ebola, and other healthcare system challenges that we have already been facing. So we cannot afford to lose more lives due to unpreparedness. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the vulnerability of the African healthcare system. And building a resilient healthcare is fundamental to the future of Africa's youth because they constitute more than 60% of the population. They are affected by issues that are fundamental to primary health care, from maternal and child health to immunization to nutritional support and reproductive health. It is important for us to put structures in place that would guarantee access to universal basic health care because there's a direct synergy between economic development and healthcare. How wonderful to include this news in our day. Well, time now for our first panel of the day, which will focus on the key components of a resilient healthcare defense system on the continent. And to set the tone for this round table, I would like now to introduce Dr. Jim Yong Kim, Vice Chairman and Partner at Global Infrastructure Partners and also former President of the World Bank. Dr. Kim, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm, uh, it's a great honor for me to be with you. So we seem to have a problem. Did you hear me, Dr. Kim? Uh, yeah. So it seems that your microphone is muted still. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Jim, we can hear you from here. Fantastic. Okay. Fantastic, hey, we can Dr. Hear you. Jim. Wonderful. Go ahead. Hello and welcome. Oh, thank you so much. It's a great honor to be on, and and I just want to uh, uh, congratulate uh, my good friend uh, President Adesina, uh, who has done uh, such a fantastic job. Uh, as president, I, I've known him from the very beginning of his uh, his tenure. I, I, I think uh, the African Development Bank and the continent are very lucky uh, to have such a wonderful, thoughtful man leading the institution. So uh, I'm very I'm very grateful, and and I'm so glad that this is the topic uh, that we're talking about here uh, today. We are very very glad as well that you could join us today. This is a great honor for us. So I would just uh, start by asking you. Actually, just like you mentioned, so we are here today at a knowledge event which forms part of uh, the uh, African Development Bank annual meetings. Why do we need to talk about a healthcare defense system in the context of the annual meetings, according to you? Well, uh, the important thing, uh, you know, at, at the World Bank Group, uh, when we started asking the question, uh, why is it important to look at, uh, at, at health and education uh, as, a, as, a, as a force for economic growth? We look back at the history 
of uh, lending in uh, uh, in the World Bank Group, and we found that uh, until relatively recently, uh, uh, up until really um, the the nineteen uh, nineties, there was a very strong bias against lending in healthcare and education. The thought was that the most important things to lend for are infrastructure. Now, you know, I of course. Uh, I'm, I'm in the business of building infrastructure now, and I believe in it very strongly. Uh, but I think uh, in those days, there was not the kind of appreciation necessary uh, th that investments in health and education are directly contributing to economic growth. Uh, you, you know, and there, were, there was, in fact, some very strong objections. And I just want to note that in, in Korea, the country where, where I was born, in the Republic of Korea, uh, the, the country itself did not qualify for a World Bank loan until 1962. And part of it was because they thought that Korea was just so poor that it wouldn't even be able to pay back a loan. In 1962, they took a loan for a road. But in 1968, their second loan, they took for uh, education and health. And that was ridiculed by people at the World Bank Group. And people at the World Bank Group were saying things like, well, how can you possibly in, uh, invest in health and education when what's really important uh, are uh, the, the kinds of hard infrastructure that every country needs? So I think you know, that understanding has evolved. And of course, uh, we've, we, we, we look very carefully at it at the World Bank Group uh, in the form of the Human Capital Project. Thank you very much. So indeed, the time is now to act, isn't it? Uh, Dr. Kim, can you talk to us about the findings of the Human Capital Index and the link between investment in healthcare and growth, please? Well, we asked a very straightforward question, uh, which was, if you look at advances in health and education uh, and you look backward, do they correlate uh, with the, the, the scale and speed of economic growth? And what we found is that if you just took five simple measures, uh, one for education and four for health, uh, and look backward, there was a, a no stronger uh, link to economic growth than those five factors. And so the conclusion, of course, was that, that we just had not appreciated, e even though the World Bank Group had uh, really jumped into uh, investing in health and education, we didn't really appreciate the direct connection between these investments in health and education and economic growth. And so this is why we put it out there. We wanted everyone to know that, look, you know, investing in health and education is not uh, an option or, or is not a choice that we make. It is, it is actually central to our main mission. And our main mission at the World Bank Group was to end extreme poverty. And of course, uh, you cannot end extreme poverty if you're neglecting the investments in health and education that are so critical to economic growth. Uh, we were actually surprised by just how strong the correlation was between investments in health and education and economic growth. Thank you very much. So what do you believe are the key strategic and development lessons about the importance of healthcare systems that we can learn from the pandemic? And particularly in a national context, you know one of the one of the major uh, events uh, of the uh, uh, late 1990s and early 2000s uh, uh, was work that I, I did along with uh, another one of your guests, uh, my good friend Dr. Moiti. You know, uh, it's hard to uh, it, it's it, it's hard for so many people in the world to really understand just how difficult that time was. Uh, but uh, Dr. Moiti and I know. Uh, that the world had written off Africa uh, back at that time around the, the question of access to HIV treatment. Uh, the, the, in the, the overwhelming consensus of everyone in the public health world at that time was that it would be impossible to treat HIV in Africa. And of course, we were outraged at the time because it meant that some 20 million people were simply going to be left to die. And so back then what we what we said was there's just no way we're going to let you do this and uh, working throughout the world health organization system we launched a, a, a program called three by five to try to get many many more people in hiv treatment and we figured out what it would take to get antiretroviral drugs to the african continent of course now more than 20 million people in africa are on treatment and i i shudder to think what would have happened 
to the African economy if we hadn't uh, done the work that we did at the World Health Organization, at the African Regional Office, uh, to ensure treatment uh, for HIV. Now, you would think that with that lesson, we would have learned about the importance of the health uh, of Africa and ensuring that Africans had access to things like essential vaccines. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the lesson we've learned uh, is that, you know, once again, Africa is the is last in line in getting uh, the, the, the access to the life-saving vaccines that they absolutely need. So the pandemic has taught us one, all the things that we have said about a virus literally stopping the global economy have come, have come true. You know, I have been on at least five different panels in which we have predicted that precisely what has happened with COVID-19 would happen someday, and it has happened. So I think now uh, we, um, we all know that it's a possibility. But I think that uh, uh, it, we have not yet learned the lesson that Africa has to have its own production capacity, that Africa has, its, has to have its own ability to ensure that life-saving uh, medicines like antiretroviral medicines or, or, or vaccines will be available uh, for Africa, not at the end of the pandemic, or not at the end of the line, but at the front of the line. I have been uh, personally working with uh, many different uh, uh, small uh, biotech startups, uh, have been in conversation with leaders of the pharmaceutical industry, and I'm quite confident that we can find a way toward building manufacturing capacity in Africa that would be transformative in many ways. I don't think, though, that, that those efforts and the, and, and the ability to respond uh, to the lessons of this pandemic I don't think the African con uh, continent will be able to respond without the very strong support and involvement of the African Development Bank. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. And very, very quickly, we are here today to talk about healthcare defense system. Could you please outline for us very rapidly the key components to such system? Well, I'm, I think uh, uh, President Anasina outlined it, but. What, what did we learn from this pandemic? The, probably the most important thing we've learned from this pandemic is that to survive uh, and, and, and to, to care for the, for the people, you need both a treatment system, right? and so many people are dying because of a lack of access to hospital beds, intensive care, and oxygen, just simple things. But we also uh, need a, a much more robust prevention system. And I think that's going to mean investing in capacity to make medicines and vaccines. It's, it's high time we did that. Uh, we've been talking about it, uh, a system like that for Africa for a very long time. It's time that we do it. And it, it, in order to do it, we will have to do it in, in combination uh, with, uh, of course, healthcare systems in every nation state and the, and the public sector. But I think we have to bring in the private sector. And in looking at the possibility of creating these facilities, I think that uh, investors uh, will be very happy uh, to, to, to participate in, the, in a system that builds these essential medical products for the African continent. And so uh, I, I, I just, I, I wanna say to uh, the African development, I, I, when I heard that this knowledge session was happening, I was just so encouraged. I'm not surprised uh, uh, President Odessin has always been a visionary. I'm not surprised, but I was so pleased because the African Development Bank has to take play its role. Nobody knows about finance. Nobody knows about economic growth. Nobody knows about working with the private sector among the great institutions in Africa in, in, the, in the way that Af the African Development Bank does. And so uh, congratulations on having this session. And uh, I'm, I stand ready to work with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with all of you uh, to build the kind of system for both treatment and prevention that Africa deserves. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. And one final question to you. This is to be the worst time to be building or rebuilding healthcare systems. So when it comes to Africa, where shall we? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last word. Where, where? Sorry. I just said, you know, this is possibly the worst time to be thinking in that regard. So when it comes to the African continent, where shall we start? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think that uh, there are many, many very well-functioning uh, systems uh, uh, in, in uh, the African continent. 
I mean, the, the, I have personally worked on systems in Rwanda and Lesotho, uh, in Malawi, through the organization Partners in Health. And, you know, I, I, I think that one of the first things that uh, we can do is uh, uh, understand that paying people to be community health workers has been a very successful formula all over the world. And, I, and, and let me just say, you know, some people think uh, paying community health workers is something that poor countries do. You know, in, in the United States, uh, I uh, worked on, on building contact tracing systems in some of the richest parts of the United States, in Massachusetts, in New Jersey, in Texas, in California, in Michigan, in Ohio, these, these very wealthy, very uh, prosperous states, because they realize that unless you have people on the ground uh, looking at, you know, doing things like contact tracing, but also just making sure that everyone is surviving, uh, these kinds of systems now are looked upon as probably the core of the future public health system that will stop these uh, uh, pandemics, these epidemics in their tracks. And so I think a very good way to start is simply by training a whole new uh, a crew of, of, of health workers. But then it's not just one thing, it's the health workers, it's the hospital beds, it's making sure that, uh, that Africa is able to, to, uh, uh, to provide oxygen uh, for all its people. And then, and, and this has to all happen very quickly, it's going to be production capacity for these vaccines. Uh, unfortunately, it, 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 we, we can't take our time with this. We have to move on all these fronts at the same time. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Kim, for sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you. Well, let's not turn to our panelists to further discuss. And they are Kenneth Ofori Atta, Minister for Finance and Economic Planning of Ghana, and chair of the boards of governors at the African Development Bank. Ali Kouli, Minister of Economy, Finance and Investment Support of Tunisia and African Development Bank governor for Tunisia. Ayman Ben, uh, ben Abderrahman, Minister of Finance of Algeria and African Development Bank governor for Algeria. Dr. Suman Pon, President of the Korea Health Industry Development Institute, and Mr. James Scriven, CEO of IDB Invest, the private sector institution of the Inter-American Development Bank Group. Welcome to you all, gentlemen. And I will start first with you, Governor Ofori Atta. Political will seems to be essential when discussing healthcare infrastructure. So how can we yeah, improve political will to prioritize investments in national and also regional healthcare um, ecosystems, please? Great. Um, thank you very much. And, and thank you, President Adesina and um, Dr. Kim. It's it's great to have you on this panel. Um, not very clear on the question, but I think, I mean, to lead off, it's really an acknowledgement of um, where we are. And I guess I could start with my own personal experience of um, going through COVID in late um, 2020, uh, which was quite an emergency. Uh, and then luckily got out of that. Um, but one was not free from that because suddenly there was a post-COVID um, attack, you would say, um, which um, might have been even more debilitating than the COVID experience itself, uh, which sent me off to, to the Mayo Clinic uh, for literally five weeks uh, of the time. And you look at the 1.3 billion population in Africa, and you wonder how, without those resources, we are going to be able to protect our own people. Um, and that was, um, I guess, from um, November 15th through, let's say, close to end of March. And that would be um, literally about four months. So you'd have lost that extent of productivity. 
Um, so the health infrastructure, as um, Dr. Kim was saying, um, leads to a lot of intervention that must happen uh, because I think it's estimated that we lose about two trillion um, annually uh, in terms of productivity during that time, knowing very well that Africa's um, GDP is about um, 2.3 trillion. Um, so it's it's really uh, an issue of um, urgency. Are we coming through? An issue of urgency that we tackle this problem. And, and we have to tackle it in a way um, of partnerships, uh, you know, uh, with WHO, Gavi, World Bank, et cetera, um, because um, for that size of population um, to be unproductive um, creates um, um, real prosperity issues for the world. And then when we look at the fulfilling the gaps um, for ourselves, uh, we ourselves should be very clear with the Africa um, med medicine agencies as to how we locate um, these manufacturing capacities um, that the president um, talked about. Um, the degree of, of imports is too high, um, but we need to be strategic about how to put this investment in play um, so that it, it, it supports um, the whole of the continent. Um, and beyond that is also uh, the financial houses, um, that's uh, Africa Development Bank, Afri Exim, et cetera all playing in their respective roles um, so that we can eliminate um, this problem. Uh, the other key enablers, of course, um, such as insurance, uh, that have to be looked at um, holistically. Um, so there's quite a bit of work to be done of urgency. And I think the issue of um, vast nationalism that has confronted us and is now looking to be resolved also makes it clear um, that we as, as, as a continent uh, need to be uh, in a hurry um, to cure um, this, this, this menace. Um, so that is uh, my personal experience and therefore for us finance ministers uh, bringing this uh, inevitable nexus uh, between uh, the healthcare industry and um, um, the finance, uh, which more often than not uh, we have neglected uh, as a profession. You can see um, the differences when about 1.2% of our GDP is used for that uh, compared to um, Latin America and other places who are um, in Asia, we are like double or six times um, what, what we are doing. For very far away from the 15% that UNICA expects us to do. Um, so we do have a long way to go. Uh, and we must uh, prioritize, uh, be strategic about it, and put partnerships together uh, and make sure that we are ready for the next pandemic. We're proceeding to the rest of our esteemed um, panelists today, I just want to ask you, talking about urgency, of course, these are urgent times. We need to go far, but we can't really go far if the finance is not there. So during a pandemic and even after, according to you, where will that finance come from? Uh, you know, it's it's interesting because, because we, we come um, um, back, back to the, the issue, issue of the global, global financial financial. architecture and what we have been doing. Um, so we look at the issue of digitalization, for example, uh, in which um, right now maybe Africa has about 450 to uh, 500 billion um, revenue through taxation, um, uh, and that's about you know 13, 14 percent revenue to GDP. Uh, Europeans have about 34 percent revenue to GDP. You know, a structural digitalization of the whole continent, you know, may very well double uh, our capacity to raise our own resources, uh, and and that therefore. It's an area that we should look at, you know, with urgency in terms of digitalization, because we can raise the money from inside. Then you look at um, the issue of um, um, illicit financial flows, another 88 billion, uh, which we should tackle um, to be able to get these receipts uh, into our own coffers. Uh, and suddenly when the pinch was up, um, I think the world is coming around 
to accept in this flat tax of 15 percent uh, from uh, multinationals uh, which will go a long way we're just recently looking at one of our major companies and the effective tax was like four percent um, so you can see the type of resources that we can generate ourselves uh, but even as we look at the issue of the sdrs and the reallocation um, i think uh, the bank makes a really good case uh, about uh, their consideration uh, in being able to funnel um, some of these resources um, through the bank, which is intimate uh, with the problem. And that should be helpful immediately um, to support uh, manufacturing and other interventions that we, we need to do. Um, so I, I think the world just needs to get very honest about um, how Africa loses money uh, and how we can therefore um, generate that to be to be able to effective in tackling tackling this problem. Thank you very much, Governor Ofori Atta. Je vais me tourner vers vous à présent, Gouverneur Pouli. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de suite au what do you think about what the governor authority has said? So where do you think we should start in your view? What are those components that are very, very essential? Thank you very much, Marie. Let me thank my co-panelists as well, including President Adesina, who is honoring us with our presence. As we have just heard, the COVID-19 pandemic is all over the world, and more particularly in Africa. It is impacting our population in a, in a very significant way. Even myself, I suffered from it. I was hospitalized, and I know that it is something very, very serious. That is why we need to take all the necessary measures in order to tackle this pandemic and all pandemics in general. Truth to say, we are, we are witnessing the weaknesses of our uh, economies, the fragilities of our health systems. But I can say, unfortunately, that we have had quite some experience in this uh, area. We have gone through very serious situations in various countries. We went through AIDS. We went through the Zika virus. We went through Sikungunya. We went through Ebola. So we have uh, some experience in the management of uh, health crisis and pandemics. Even so, every day we realize that our infrastructure is inadequate. We realize every day that our pharmaceutical industry is not uh, fit for, uh, to, reply, to respond to these issues. And we realize that all the efforts we make in the area of education, the training of our health uh, staff is not sufficient. Here, once again, I think that the ADB has a key role to play in all these areas. One, to help all our countries to increase our investment in infrastructure. Today, only 5% of our budgets, on average, are devoted to health. I think this figure has to increase and increase significantly. We also need to learn to create African complementarity in our infrastructure. Secondly, the pharmaceutical industry in Africa is lagging way behind. You know, if you look at the gap as concerns vaccine between the rich and the poor countries, the gap between the north and the south, the gap, you know, you know in terms of research and development, the situation is such that some people are only buying and not producing. So we need to intervene in this area to strengthen our research and development capacity. It is very important for us to produce our own medication. It is very important for us in Africa to produce generic drugs 
because our economies need cheap uh, medication or low-cost medication. It is also very important for us to have an R&D uh, policy that will help us uh, overcome all these problems. And I am proud to say that the Pasteur Institute in Tunisia has uh, number, the number of patents on behalf of uh, to Tunisia in the area of health. And uh, I would like that across the continent, we adopt the same approach. And uh, in this area, the African Development Bank has a key play, a role to play in making available the necessary financing for knowledge activities in the area. I also believe strongly that upgrading our health workers is very, very important. I believe that uh, the rates of uh, staffing in our hospital is low. I think the training of our health staff is too low. And when you look at uh, the unemployment rates that we have today on the African continent, I believe that we need to invest strongly in the training of our health workers. Why am I saying all of this? I mentioned a number of pandemics and severe pandemics we have experienced. We are in the midst of another very, very serious pandemic known as COVID-19. But uh, with the changing world, we are not sheltered from new uh, uh, emerging pandemics. Of course, we need to do everything to stabilize the COVID-19 situation in the coming weeks or months or years. But we also need to look forward because this is not going to be the last pandemic that the world will witness. It is not going to be the last pandemic that Africa will experience. So we need to work together to make our systems more efficient so that we can better challenge these pandemics, pandemics going forward. So this is a call to all my colleagues, the governors, to all African states, and uh, so that we can pool and mutualize our knowledge, our experience, so that we come out victorious in this battle and prepare our future generations to better affront them. Dr. Kouli, thank you very much. We are pleased to know that uh, you survived the virus. We are quite pleased to hear that. Thank you very much. Now, Governor Ben Abderrahman, what in your view, since we are talking about reforms, what do you think should be the main institutional reforms required to guarantee regional or continental alignment for uh, large-scale impact? I thank you for your question. Allow me to start by thanking President Adeshina and Dr. Kim for their introductory and relevant uh, pertinent remarks at the beginning of our session, they clearly identified the challenges facing African countries when it comes to managing their health issues and putting in place uh, performing health systems. COVID-19 only came to reveal some weaknesses and the dysfunctioning of some of our systems. In my view, the issue relating to the health system in Africa is very uh, intimately linked to financing, to the available availability of budget resources. Each country has its priorities. Of course, each country has listed its priorities and budget allocation is in relation to these priorities. So it depends on, on the prioritization uh, by each African country of uh, health coverage. The, the second point has to do with uh, the difficulty in covering our uh, giving optimal coverage to our territories. And the third issue is uh, population. In Africa, the population is growing so fast that sometimes it is difficult to, to cope with uh, on the basis of existing resources. The fourth challenge is the type of training we uh, are having. You know that optimal health coverage requires a training, a performing education system that helps to identify the nature of the pathology, 
to be managed in the health system and some pathologies as Africa, you know, we have uh, some cyclical uh, pathologies, but there are some uh, pathologies uh, which uh, need to be tackled particularly. And concerning the management of all these uh, issues, my country has carried out a number of uh, reforms on the basis of uh, free access to medical health and then universal uh, health coverage of uh, our country. You know, we, we have a, a large surface area. We need to make uh, considerable efforts in terms of budget allocation in order to provide health services to the entire country. And uh, this has paid off because uh, in the HDI, we are third after Seychelles and Mauritius. And uh, in terms of life expensive, uh, expectancy, we are, we are over 70 for women and uh, quite a high figure for women. So we are, these are fundamentals that we need to follow in order to ensure a performing health system. Once again, of course, there is the resource constraint. And in my view, our bank, the African Development Bank, banks support the most uh, vulnerable African economies and help guide them in terms of uh, the uh, priorities and also proper governance in the health sector is important. We have, we have infrastructure, but uh, the quality of health itself is a problem despite this, uh, this infrastructure. So our bank can help us to uh, come up with methods of uh, governance for our health facilities, and this will help us move forward and uh, even uh, be uh, competing with uh, what is happening uh, with what is happening around the Mediterranean region and in Europe, why not? So, so we, I am sure that uh, there would be a return on investment very quickly. So, the fundamental principles to be retained is uh, universal uh, free uh, access to health, solidarity, equity and continuity of uh, public health service. These are all principles which we need to uphold to ensure the optimal health coverage of the African population and move forward in terms of uh, our prioritization. That is what I had to say at this point, and uh, I am uh, quite uh, will willing to come back if you need. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Governor Ben Abderrahman. Thank you for underlining a fact which the President mentioned. We need a new uh, generation of health services that have quality and that are accessible to all Africans, no matter their level of income. Thank you very much for your contribution. So I would like to have your reaction, of course, to what has been said so far, but I would just like to direct a question to you specifically, because many countries look to Korea, to the Korean res response to COVID-19 as an example, a model. So what can you share about the Koreans' experience? What worked for your country? Thank you. Um, from Korea, uh, the Minister of Finance, uh, Mr. Hong Nam-gi, Mr. Governor for, for Korea, cannot join this meeting uh, because uh, there is a uh, big parliamentary sessions for budgeting. So uh, I will give some of my thoughts, share some of my ex uh, thoughts and experience of, of, of the response to COVID-19 in, in Korea with you. Um, I think uh, in, as, a, as, a, as, a, as good response to a pandemic, uh, preparedness is very important. So investment uh, in the fiscal structure, human resources, and, and overall healthcare systems, including pharmaceutical sector, uh, definitely constitutes a, a good preparedness for a pandemic like COVID-19. 
but but as you know, it is very difficult to be fully prepared for a pandemic because we still face lots of uncertainty and contingencies. So in that sense, I like to um, emphasize that in addition to a preparedness, a capacity for policymaking effectively is another very important component. For example, uh, capacity to make policy decisions based on new evidence or based on the experiences of successes and failures of policy, that type of agile policymaking is also very important success factors in addition to a good preparedness. And in, in a sense, I think around, around the whole world, COVID-19 uh, provided us a good opportunity, especially for the, for the Ministry of Finance or Ministry of Economy was able to fully appreciate the importance of health as an investment for the economy. Or, or the close interconnectedness between health and economy. So health sector is no more a, a consumption, but health sector itself is an investment. We, we, if we do not invest in the health system enough, it will have a disastrous impact on the economy. That is the key lesson we learned from this COVID-19. And also I like to, in that sense, I like to emphasize the, the importance of governance system, because it's not just a health issue. It is basically a social catastrophe. So to, to cope with this social catastrophe pandemic, we need a whole of the government governance. It's not just the Ministry of Health, but we have good support from the Ministry of Finance or Ministry of Education, good communication among those ministries. It also applies to the topic of, of today, investment in the pharmaceutical sector. Because funding is, of course, very important for the research and development and production. But what is the, another key element for the pharmaceutical industry? Like, uh, because we need a good innovation system and research and development should be supported by, say, say Ministry of Science and Technology and a good manufacturing system need a good support from the Ministry of Industry. Of course, I mean, Ministry of Health is so important. And also uh, this COVID-19 experience shows the importance of the private sector, like in terms of health services, we cannot simply rely on public hospitals. We also need to you know, incentivize and mobilize private hospital systems so that they play a, another very key role in the treatment of COVID-19 patient. It's the same, I mean, to the pharmaceutical industry, the majority of the pharmaceutical business industry are the private sector. So how to incentivize them, how to support them, uh, that is a, a very uh, important component for, for the pharmaceutical sector. So what I'm saying is, is that it's not just an investment in the physical infrastructure, but we also need a good investment in the governance, regulatory capacity, policymaking capacity. We need a good ecosystem, for example, in the case of the pharmaceuticals, we need a good ecosystem or policy to, to support, promote, reward the innovations. That, that is another very important component in addition to the manufacturing capacity for the pharmaceutical industry, especially in, in, in the medium and long term. Thank you. Just mentioned the private sector. So this is my transition to go to you, Mr. Scriven. So among the weaknesses, well, that um, the African healthcare has shown is possibly that poor collaboration between public and private sectors. So what would you recommend to improve that collaboration, please, Mr. Scriven? Uh, 
Well, thank you very much for the for the question. I wanted to first by thank, start by thanking President Adesina for his invitation. Uh, as he and many of you know, Africa is very close to my heart. I have a long history of working through the World Bank in the African continent. Uh, as as you know, I'm part of the Inter-American Development Bank, and I run the private sector arm of the IDB group. And as such, I wanted to complement and add a few thoughts to the question and what was a key address by, by a Dr. Jim Kim that I thought was extremely to the point. Uh, we're a firm believer that the response responses to the biggest challenges of, of our development world are should be and are being addressed by a collaboration or close relationship between the private sector and the public sector. And I applaud President Adesina for his role in not only growing the role and impact that the public sector side of the African Development Bank has, but also the private sector, because the collaboration and the work that comes together by these two big units is where the solutions come. Uh, thanks to the scientific community in partnership with the private sector, we have today vaccines that can reduce the severity and frequency of infections. Uh, this We've seen it in Latin America, and from my experience and my knowledge, it's very, very similar in, in Africa. But I wanted to address exactly your question in raising four areas in which we see a very strong role of the private sector. One, in test, treatment, and distribution of vaccines. This is a key priority for the fight of, against pandemic, and we're seeing in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, an increasing role in the private sector in testing, treating, and distributing vaccines. Second, health infrastructure, filling the significant gap that still prevails in infrastructure and rehabilitation of hospital, clinics, pathology labs, diagnostic images. Third, medical equipment delivered by enabling health providers to acquire advanced equipment that can improve the quality and reliability of care providers. And fourth, strengthening regional and local pharma manufacturing cap capabilities, given the fact that our countries mostly rely on imported medications compounds, compounding the vulnerability of national health systems during the pandemic. So where I see uh, it is the critical role of combining public and private sector. The private sector is a major part in healthcare in every country. However, in scope, activities and integration with the public financing and policies vary significantly across the system. So strategic opportunity we're engaging with the private sector can complement the government's effort. And this and the key role that we have seen in, in Latin America and the Caribbean is the, the role that PPPs, public-private partnerships, have in this case. We financed a number of hospitals that came through the PPP structures that the public sector arm of the IDB helped regulate, helped prepare, helped launch. But us, through IDB Invest, helped the financing of those hospitals through open and transparent uh, processes. So thank you very much for the question. I'm happy to expand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Striven. And it's wonderful to hear experiences from different parts of the world, from Asia, from North and South America. That's wonderful. Well, this is bringing us to the end of our panel today. But before letting you go, I would like to kindly share three key words that you would like us to take away today from what you have said. And I would like to start with you, Governor Ofori Atta. So if you have three key words for us to take away, which would they be? Uh, thank you. Did you say three words to, for takeaway? Yeah? yeah. It's, it's very difficult to go against um, President Adesina uh, when I think in the first um, knowledge gathering he talked about 
resilience, 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 uh, which is important. But but truly, I think the the issue for us is the first question you ask: Where are we going to get the financing to be able to do all of these issues that have been brought on the table? Um, that has also because of us and nationalism the extent of um, two people per hundred having doses versus 68 uh, in the West uh, becomes how do we get the capacity um, to be able to draw in the financing? And I did mention that we needed partnership first working of Gavi, UNICEF, WHO, World Bank, etc. That's important. But looking at our own um, instruments, to be able to to speak to our shareholders and stakeholders that we really look at the way in which we fund ADF um, so that we can go to the market such as the World Bank is doing to free up more capital for that. Um, to be quite emphatic about the distribution of the 650 billion SDRs so that some of those resources will come directly um, to the Africa Development Bank to ensure that we tackle the issues of training, education, and manufacturing that, that is required. And that then would give us the resilience, resilience, resilience that we need for the future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Governor of Oriata. Resilience, resilience, resilience. It's easy enough to remember. C'est à vous, Gouverneur Pouli. Your turn, Governor Cooley. What would be the three words you would like us to remember today? Thank you, Anne-Marie. I would say solidarity. I would say determination. And I would say optimism. Because together, and thanks to the considerable support provided by the African Development Bank, together we will succeed, we shall prevail. So my message is a message of hope to the whole continent. Thank you. Let me turn to you, Governor Ben Abderrahman, what would be your three key words? Thank you, Anne-Marie. I must say, uh, given the importance of this subject, to select three words, but if I may, let me make an attempt to do so. I would say prioritization, universal availability, healthcare, and digitization. So as you note, there are four keywords, not three, but I believe they are interrelated and will enable us to make progress. When we talk about prioritization, each of our countries must prioritize budget lines for healthcare, for health, health, and health. If we invest significantly in the health system, we will be able to preserve the health of our populations, which will have a positive impact on society, on productivity, on education, and on all the socio-economic sectors of uh, the country. If the healthcare is free, we will be able to have better fairness towards uh, the most vulnerable, and there will be uh, fairness in uh, the budget appropriations. So the third word is digitization, which will undoubtedly help improve on healthcare and will also ensure optimization of budget resources but it will also enable us to deal uh, with uh, the cases of patients digitally. And for countries such as ours, uh, which are quite large, this will be a very significant asset. So uh, by order of priority, I would say budget prioritization, uh, universal access and digitization. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you, Governor Ben Abderrahman. You have mentioned something that had also been mentioned by Dr. Wan earlier on, which is to consider health systems as being an investment with an adequate return on investment. Sorry. 
Okay. Uh, agile policy making. Second, whole of government governance. Third, ecosystem for health care and pharmaceutical innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kwon. And now it's your turn, Mr. Scriven. What are your key uh, words for us today? Thank you. Um, my British background requires that I keep to exactly that really three words. And for me, it is built back better. And I do believe that, as, as I said, and was discussed, the role of the partnership between the private and the public sector is important. And second, the innovative structures that we're seeing in the world of collaboration and experimentation are key to solving these issues. So the key three words is building back better, uh, helping through the private sector in an innovative way to make it sustainable and inclusive. Thank you. Very much, Mr. Scriven, Dr. Kwon, governors, this was a pleasure. Thank you. And I want to add, build back better, build back healthier, in fact. Well, we have heard from our experts. Let's now turn back to our young people who are also eager to contribute. have a fundamental role to play in helping to build resilient healthcare system defense, particularly when it comes to promotion of health policies and health education and awareness. As a matter of fact, the Commonwealth Framework on Health Policies recognizes youth as both beneficiaries and deliverers of public health. We have seen the role that technology is playing in the pandemic. We, Africa has a very vibrant, youthful population innovators who can help develop solutions that addresses these global health challenges. I believe that every African youth can become a champion of positive change wherever they are, regardless of their gender, their social status, their economic background, and all other factors that may seem like roadblocks. To me, I believe that everyone can look into the healthcare system in their country, find a challenge and innovate around it to create a solution. We can all become solution bearers in one way or another, whether it's creating a device or it's coming up with changes in systems like the way drugs are delivered. <laughs> And I now have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Matkidi Somoeti, the World Health Organization Regional Director for Africa. She's also the first woman to be elected to this position and is now in her second term. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. Well, first, I'd like to thank sincerely President uh, Adesina for the invitation. It, it's been some time since I came to visit you in uh, Abidjan, and I'm very happy to reconnect, very honored to be asked to join this, um, this session. I'd also like to greet the panelists of the session, the Honorable Amadou Hot, uh, the Chief uh, Executive Officer of IDV, and uh, my colleague and friend John Gangasong, whom I saw was uh, connected. But I'd also like to say a special greeting to Dr. Jim Kim, who worked with and inspired me as his counterpart in the region on our collective work uh, as WHO on the, <clears throat> that initiative to address a huge injustice and feature of inequality of access to treatment for HIV for, for African people. Thank you for referring to that and for that uh, shared experience. It is a pleasure for me to join this conversation on the strategic imperative of boosting local pharmaceutical production in African countries. And to start with some reflections and questions to start off the discussion by our distinguished panelists. And leading on from the previous panel, I have to say that um, you have laid out the issues, the ideas extremely well. And you can see clearly that investing in health is incredibly important. This includes investing in 
securing critical supplies as well. The World Bank has estimated that every month of delay in rolling out COVID-19 vaccines on the African continent costs $13.8 billion in lost GDP. And while advanced economies are pushing forward with recovery, the IMF projects that Sub-Saharan Africa will be the world's slowest growing region in 2021. And here I'm speaking really to an audience that understands this better than I do as a health professional. But it's estimated that the region's economy contracted by almost 2% in 2020. We have seen this before, as several speakers have already said. So I'll just take the example of the West Africa Ebola epidemic, where more than $3.6 billion was spent on the response and the economic impact is estimated at about $54 billion. These examples highlight that health and the economy are inextricably linked, as has already very eloquently been illustrated, and health is a prerequisite to economic growth. Health is a transformative area where the African Development Bank's investments can spur sustainable economic development and social progress and concretely fight poverty. And as WHO, I just like to add our voice in welcoming and encouraging this engagement and indicating that we will commit ourselves to working closely in partnership as we play our complementary role of advising governments and partner stakeholders on policies, on evidence-based norms, support the building of capacity, which has very much been referred to in the previous session, and evaluating to demonstrate that investments are delivering tangible results or not. It is possible to prevent or mitigate the impacts of health emergencies on lives, livelihoods, and economies. African governments have recognized this and increasingly are adopting policies linking improving their health systems as a path to universal health coverage with developing the resilience that is so important. The key is to deal with the vulnerabilities of healthcare systems in African countries. And this includes addressing weak governance, policy making and prioritization, these have already been emphasized, and also addressing the increasing fragmentation. And I have to confess that as the international community, we are partly responsible for the fragmentation of the health systems in Africa. We are starting to work to stop it. What can be done, for example, to create a robust system and a supportive regulatory environment for public-private partnerships? I join those who have emphasized that this is absolutely critical for health development in Africa. We need data systems that are capable of monitoring, evaluating, ensuring accountability, and assuring learning of lessons as well, so that we continue indeed to build back better from this pandemic. Key inputs into a resilient health system capable of delivering healthcare to the poorest people who are at the most the furthest distance from the capital cities require attention such as infrastructure. And I've heard infrastructure mentioned in several senses, starting from the most peripheral health post, which constitutes a contact between people and the health system that will enable you to know when a strange pattern of disease is starting to spread, meaning an epidemic is starting to spread. That's absolutely vital, in addition to providing access to basic healthcare services. It's very important as well to leverage hugely the potential of digital technology to address the human resources gaps and the shortages of supplies and equipment, and also to invest in expanding homegrown research and innovation. At WHO, several years ago, we launched an innovation challenge. And I would like to echo what was said by the young people in the film, that it mobilized hundreds of young innovators in different spheres of health development. So certainly the talent is there, the creativity is there. It just needs nurturing and it needs investment. And similarly, we have many researchers in Africa who are basically carrying out research to the agendas of international funders because local and domestic financing for research and development is relatively limited. So these are some of the areas that really do need financing. And indeed, at the base of these vulnerabilities is financing for health. 
as a percentage of government expenditure, allocations for health have stagnated at around 8% in the past decade. So what are the barriers to raising the share for health? I was very happy to hear very strongly stated by uh, honorable ministers of finance who are the, the governors of the African Development Bank, the recognition of the importance in financing for health. And I think that we can also see what is the best way to finance health in such a way that it drives equity, it leaves no one behind, it, it, it engages the private sector as well so that we pull together these financing resources. Coming now in terms of access to medical products. First of all, it's a very painful realization that Africa is a prime market for fake medicines with serious and often disastrous impacts of health. And then also to note that 99% of the vaccines and 70% of pharmaceuticals are imported to African countries. During the pandemic, we've pinned our hopes on global solidarity and are right now being hit with a huge reality check brought home dramatically in the example of access to COVID-19 vaccines. And this has highlighted the need for self-reliance. This is an extension of the enormous difficulties that countries have had in accessing testing supplies in the early phases of the pandemic. I have to share that as somebody who has been leading WHO's efforts in Africa to provide support to our countries to the pandemic, one of the most painful aspects has been the ongoing chronic difficulties in our countries of accessing testing supplies and the realization that about 12 uh, low-income countries in Africa have never managed to test at the minimal level that WHO recommends in order to really know what is happening. And this was because of uh, difficulties in accessing supplies, accessing uh, equipment, decisions to stop exportation by some of the countries where the companies will produce some of these items are located. So this has been indeed a huge wake up call for all of us. So learning from this experience, how can governments and partners address the vulnerabilities in the global pharmaceutical supply chain? How can we build resilience through investments in local production? And what aspects should be considered in pursuing this? African heads of state have expressed their ambitions for industrialization and the African continental free trade area would be a key enabler. So successfully translating this political will into action will be a collective enterprise. A very exi exciting example was announced this week of the first COVID-19 messenger RNA vaccine te technology transfer hub to be established in South Africa. This international public-private partnership is an important start to building the infrastructure and human resource capacity to contribute to closing the gap in access to vaccines on the continent. I see the African Development Bank playing a critical role in accompanying the continent on this journey, working with the African Union Commission and the Africa CDC. And I engage that WHO will be an active partner in this enterprise. Clearly, accountability will be important between states, and we have learned from other examples of working collectively that this may be a challenge, but it is absolutely needed. So how can we establish systems and use technology to ensure that all the stakeholders play their roles? Unfortunately, we can catch up on missed opportunities. There is some expertise among manufacturing entities in African countries, but many of these are operating at a fraction of their capacity. So how can their experience and expertise be leveraged? Can the local output be increased to meet Africa's needs? And if so, what would it take? And what socioeconomic gains would this bring? I believe personally this would bring enormous socioeconomic gains to the continent. In considering economies of scale, we are aware of course that the market share is uh, <clears throat> to some degree dominated by some mega producers like India and China. So we have to consider how local production can be developed in ways that are sustainable and that capture a certain proportion of the market and assure African countries of access to the essential supplies 
even when there is no pandemic. To make local production as competitive as possible, what are some of the efficiencies that need to be put into the systems? All this needs to be looked at and agreed beyond national borders to establish multi-country approaches, agreeing on where hubs should be placed and used using platforms that don't delay the final decision making. I'd like to add that the regulatory side will also be critical, including on quality control, market creation, procurement, and facilitating buying and acquisition. The establishment of the African Medicines Agency will support the growth of local production. And I'm aware that our colleague and friend, Honorable Michelle Sidibe, is traveling actively around the continent, getting countries to ratify this. This institution needs to get up and run efficiently as soon as possible. So we need to reflect together what needs to happen over and above its establishment. It will be a unique partnership among African countries. For now, Many national regulatory authorities are severely under-resourced and understaffed in African countries. As WHO, we are working with countries to strengthen regulatory systems towards manufacturing excellence, including through the African Vaccines Regulatory Forum, which enables the regulatory authorities to share capacities, approaches, and tools. So how can the strengthening of regulatory capacities be fast-tracked to boost local production? Past attempts to increase pharmaceutical manufacturing have tended to hit against the barriers of pricing and to some degree quality. Some of the biggest drivers of high prices are taxes and we are informed power supply shortages. And in some countries, taxes are low on finished pharmaceutical products, but high for the raw materials. So imported pharmaceuticals end up being cheaper. How can this balance be redefined? If taxes are lowered, on the other hand, where will the money come from to finance essential services for populations? Is there an opportunity, and I believe there is really an opportunity for institutions like the African Development Bank to provide support to governments, perhaps to offset some of the short-term losses. All of this relates to the issue of fairness and high interest rates in African countries. Investors find lower risk costs and higher returns elsewhere, perhaps, so what else can be done to encourage investment on the continent? And indeed, what should be the formula for working with the private sectors? Companies and individuals have mobilized resources and networks to support the COVID-19 response, yielding huge benefits. How can we build on this momentum to support manufacturing and health system strengthening on the continent? There are very challenging discussions going on currently on patent waivers and technology transfer which it is important for all of us, our member states, to engage in with the private sector. But what additional ways are there of collaborating in particular to facilitate the emergence of a local pharmaceutical industry? In the coming years, the, vac the African vaccines market is expected to continue to grow steadily, and this needs to be accompanied by human capital development to ensure the availability of the right expertise. This is also required partnerships across sectors. It's already been said. There are opportunities to mobilize the African diaspora, a huge, huge plus. What incentives would be needed for skilled Africans working abroad to return home and contribute to industrial growth? In closing, local manufacturing is an example of an immediate opportunity to address a crisis, and it calls for financing a conducive environment incentives for investors and creating production capacity, including a skilled workforce. Building health systems resilience and boosting production are multifaceted issues that call for work across development sectors. The bank in partnership with ministers of finance are in a unique position to influence, to advocate, to invest, and to take action that could be transformative and deliver long-term benefits for health and economic growth. So I look forward very much to a thought-provoking discussion today. And thank, you, and thank you for the wonderful start in the previous session. As WHO, I commit that we stand ready to partner strongly with and complement the African Development Bank and other partners as they engage in health investments on the continent. And thank you for the opportunity.
Dr. Mwedi, thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, a lot lot of food for thought you have given us and I think there is much that we will be able to build on in our conversation coming up. Also to Anne-Marie a little bit earlier, thank you very much for uh, setting the scene so well. So we've been hearing a lot about the questions that need to be answered. We've heard plenty about what the challenges may be uh, with regard to the, the pharmaceutical space in Africa. We're not going to have this conversation on our own and we don't have a huge amount of time. So I'm going to go ahead straight to it. I have panelists who help me unpack these things, you know. The first is Mr. Amadou Hart, who is the Minister of Economy, Planning and International Cooperation and the African Development Bank Governor for Senegal. To you, Mr. Minister, welcome. Uh, James Scriven, the CEO of IDB Invest, is still with us. Hello again, James. And Dr. John Kingasong, who is the director for the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to you. To all three of you, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Perhaps, Dr. Nginga Song, if I could begin with you. The picture has been painted quite clearly that the situation in Africa is quite dire. So let's use this opportunity to try to unpack what needs to happen and when. My layman's ma mind would argue that the first step needs to be building the skills and making sure that there is a building and a sufficient specialized workforce. But that's me. Where do you think we should start? Uh, th thank you so much for the opportunity to um, include me as, as part of this conversation. And I would like to um, thank the uh, African Development Bank, uh, especially the President Adesina for your championship of the, the, health, the need to strengthen health systems and your freezing and framing as uh, strengthening Africa's uh, health defenses has uh, resonated with, with, with us. And we like to recognize the strong support that the ADB has uh, invested in uh, the start of Africa CDC before I came and what they are currently doing uh, with a, a very generous support of $26 million uh, last year that they gave us to continue to strengthen our health defenses for, for the continent. So the president, your words are not just words, but they have been translated into uh, action. Uh, Ebola, I may start at that. I'll come to your question about workforce very quickly, but Ebola was a signal for us that something severe was going to come. And you can also look at the COVID-19 as, 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 as an indication that if it's something more severe, will come if we do not strengthen our health defenses there for the continent. I, as a virologist for 32 years, I like to paint a picture of a, of a virus that may emerge and completely overwhelm us. A virus that spreads like COVID-19, that is very fast. A virus that has a case fatality rate of about 20%, like the, the, or 30%. This virus case fatality is about 2.7% on our continent. So you may actually see a virus like the SARS that occurred 20 years ago that has a much higher case fatality rate. And a virus that is hard to develop a vaccine like HIV. So none of that is abstract. These are all viruses that we are dealing with. I mean, we don't have a vaccine for HIV. You have a virus that transmits that much and a virus that is uh, um, kills that quickly. We may be in a very difficult position. So that is the, my starting point. So we need to do four things and do them simultaneously. And uh, uh, Chidi has mentioned this and greetings, uh, Chidi uh, from Addis Ababa. Uh, with the four things are uh, workforce. We really need to be very deliberate in, in our workforce development. We cannot do that in piecemeal. Otherwise, the next pandemic and the picture that I just painted will surprise us. We used to say that we should be ready for a pandemic, but it came faster than we, we, we thought. So workforce development is extremely important. The second thing we need there is, again, a uh, uh, touch on this, is manufacturing. It was striking that last year, uh, the president, President Adesina himself, uh, moderated a seminar where diagnostics, we were quarrying over diagnostics across the world. Uh, diagnostics were in short supply. They were not available in Africa. Africa was accused of not testing enough, but there were no diagnostics to be bought. 
and uh, the president organized a seminar where we brought in Africans to innovate that, in that space and develop that. So I say this deliberately because they, they, I hear a lot of discussion on vaccine manufacturing, but very little on diagnostics there. I think this is key. You go to war against these viruses with three dimensions. You, you have to have your diagnostics, vaccines and treatment all together. So that has to be a, an African driven solution and approach for that. The third area, of course, is institutions. You, you fight wars with institutions and, and, and strong public health institutions for the continent. Clearly, no doubt about that. And then thirdly, partnership with the private sector. If we do those four things and do them quickly, then we will prepare ourselves for this uh, virus that I've painted that will probably emerge in the next coming years. Yeah, but the ADB has to play a central role in this. I'll just say that as my conclusion, that in all areas that I've mentioned there, it has to be very deliberate. I've always said that you don't dig your wells when you are testy. You dig your wells before you are testy. So you don't build health systems when you are in a pandemic. You build health systems before the pandemic hits. So I think uh, I'm really looking forward to strong partnership with the ADB to continue that leadership in investment in, in health systems. All right, Dr. Nkengatsong, thank you very much for, for, for those remarks. A theme that seems to be emerging over the last few days is the question of partnership and making sure that the private sector is brought on board. Um, perhaps, James, if I, if I could then come to you and looking at the way in which one is able to leverage the lessons learned in your sphere of work and building capacity, making sure that the private sector is actually along for the ride. Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think as, as keynote speakers have said and all, all panels have said, this crisis has brought to the forefront the critical role that local private sector, in particular pharma companies, can play in, in, in emerging uh, economies. Whether in Africa or Latin America, the truth is that our countries rely on imported medication. This is not enough. A recent study from the World Health Organization shows that 2 billion people worldwide lack access to diagnostics, vaccines, and treatments. In other words, one for every four people around the world have no access to basic treatments. COVID-19 has not only exasperated this problem of equitable access to vaccines and treatment, but also the fact that there is a big risk in relying on global supply chains in which the supply of many essentials and critical drugs is dependent on overseas suppliers. Therefore, the, 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 there is an important role that we have, and this is the right time to strengthen pharma in manufacturing capabilities in emerging countries and supporting business models that can expand the reach of supply of medicines and healthcare. And the, the multilateral development banks can play a catalytic role to support the private sector. Let me give you a few examples of what we've done in Latin America. In Latin America, we are seeing interesting trends worth supporting. The digitalization of businesses that also permitted the pharma value chain. And we're seeing emerging leading technologies based on businesses with a high development impact. For example, in 2020, we IDB Invest made an equity investment in Farmalito. It's a leading platform in home health technology in Latin America. Farmalito is a 100% digital pharmacy, which additionally provides home health and telemedicine services through its digital platform. We are supporting a pilot of digitalization of preventive telemedicine with devices to monitor chronic diseases. Though the use of portable devices from Marito will offer telemonitoring and telemedicine services for patients supporting diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, as well as radiology services at home. So we feel that the pharma market is generally off for interesting business opportunities with potential for high development. It is projected that the global pharma market will grow at least annually 4.4% and reach 1.5, yeah, 1,550 billion by 2020. In Latin America, it is the fastest growing region in terms of generic drugs, which projected to grow at 14% in the last year. So we do believe that increasingly, uh, the role of the private sector will play a key role in addressing the production, as I said before, distribution uh, of vaccines. 
Thank you very much, James. Uh, Minister Hart, if I can then come to you. Of course, there is the question of uh, the, the private sector. The regulatory framework is yet another consideration, and all of this really speaks to the increase of capacity on the continent to ensure that we are able to produce quality drugs that uh, are not substandard and that do not endanger people's health. But all, all of this has to happen in some way, shape or form that is going to be sustainable in the longer term. How do you see us improving the environment for engendering the improvement of the pharmaceutical sector on the continent? To me, thank you very much for having me uh, today at this session. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as you know, like in many other African countries, uh, the pharmaceutical industry today is a nascent industry. Uh, like in Senegal, for example, 90% of the products are still imported. And uh, we need to change that situation. That is why, for example, in Senegal, we established a new, uh, let's say, strategy to boost the pharmaceutical industry, especially follow following the COVID-19. We realized that we need to be more independent, we need to be more resilient, especially uh, since the uh, international value chains can be broken, are not immune to disruption, especially when you have major crisis. And uh, during in that strategy, we are promoting many reforms, uh, reforms to change drastically the pharmaceutical code, for example. In many African countries, in particular also in Senegal, the code dates back to maybe uh, before independence or just after independence, and it doesn't meet the reality of the terrain now. And also the uh, private sector is not, let's say, a well, let's say, invited into the sector, because in some countries, like in Senegal until recently, uh, to, be, to have a pharmaceutical industry, the shareholders, for example, and need to be pharmacists, and, and it should not be the case. Anybody should be able to invest in a, in, a, in a pharmaceutical industry and then invite the experts to come and manage that business for you. And it's not, uh, sadly, it's not only in Senegal, it's in many countries, and we are trying to change that. And the tax system also need to be adapted uh, so that actually you can give some com comparative advantage to local production as well. In many countries, like in Northern Africa, these are the kind of things that you see there. So, and also the market is very fragmented. That's why we need to have African countries to work together to have the same, let's say, regulatory framework to approve, let's say, drugs, so that a drug produced in Senegal should be sold in Nigeria, let's say, or Cote d'Ivoire, without having to go through the process of validation again. And all these reforms need to happen if we want to have a bigger pharmaceutical sector, a less fragmented pharmaceutical sector. So harmonization, I think what you're talking about is quite key. We've seen yeah. that in a number of sectors on the African continent where that kind of harmonization is quite a difficult thing to do. An argument that people may bring to bear is health sovereignty. So we want to be able to do what we want to do in the way that works for us. So my question then to you is, if we're looking at trying to foster harmonization, how difficult or how easy is that going to be? I mean, it can be difficult if you want to do it across Africa, across the 54 uh, countries. That will be very difficult. But Africa has economic uh, blocks. If you look at West Africa, we have the ECOWAS, 15 countries uh, with uh, uh, four major economies. And I, and I think we can harmonize by economic zones and economic blocks. East Africa can do the same, Southern Africa, North Africa. And then at the later stage, with the Zlekaf and uh, the, 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 the single market, we can then try at the later stage to harmonize at a pan-African level. I think it has to be a two-stage two process, and it should be uh, successful, I think, if you do it this way. But I recognize the difficulties, even within ECOWAS, even within the one new zone, which has only eight countries in West Africa, it is difficult. But if there is a political will, I think we can make it happen. 
role is absolutely key. I've got a question that I'd like you to answer. And then, James, I'd like you to answer the same question. Financing is always important in matters like this. So what kind of financing are we looking at talking about? Perhaps, Minister, if you can address that first. And then, James, if you can address that immediately thereafter, please. Minister, go ahead. Yes, for me, it should be depending, let's say, on the drugs that you are trying to, 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 to have, uh, to have a blended finance model. If, for example, you're looking at the, let's say, COVID vaccines in Senegal, we're trying to produce uh, the anti-COVID vaccine with the Institute Pasteur that has been chosen also by the African Union. And many partners are helping in that project. But we have, one, the government putting in some grant money, some subsidy uh, to, to kickstart the project. Some partners putting in grant money as well. But we are looking also at senior debt coming from DFIs mainly. We are looking also at uh, uh, mezzanine finance. And then lastly, at equity. So the most expensive, let's say, uh, financing or the most expensive, let's say, uh, a cost of capital uh, should be reserved to, let's say, uh, uh, drugs or let's say vaccines that are needed that are not for the masses. Anything that is for the masses should be cheap enough to really incentivize uh, the population to use it. So the cost should be affordable. And to have it affordable, you need the cost of financing is extremely important. That's why blended finance is important. So you'll have a DFI's government and then the private sector, and you minimize the private sector's money. But then in other drugs and vaccines or other things, then there maybe you can increase the cost, of, let's say the, the share of private financing. It could even be 100% private financing, but with the government providing the incentives and incentives in particular, let's say to, uh, to train uh, the, the, the workers, to train the experts. And that training, the cost of that training, most of the time should come from the government and its partners and not necessarily uh, from the corporation itself. And it's a win-win, it has to be a win-win, a partnership and each party providing what they are best at if we are to achieve an optimum and optimal resource. James? Yeah, I, I think uh, the governor for, for Senegal answered it much better than I can ever do. I would just add two concepts. One is, uh, I think it, it's evident to everybody the cost of shutting down economies because of COVID-19. So a concept that I'd like to leave with all of you that everybody know much better than I is the money that we invest in pharma is money well spent. Mm -hmm. would be recovered in many forms through the activation of the economy. And second one, one ingredient that I'd like to, uh, to, uh, to add to the concept that the minister presented is the, the access of local currency. Uh, this is when people that are paying or will be using the pharmacy, um, pharma, uh, have their income in local currency. So I think it's important that we find creative structures in addition to the products that were highlighted by the minister, also the possibility of financing uh, these pharmaceuticals and local currency. So that those are the only additional points that I would add, but I subscribe to everything that the minister has said. James, thank you very much. Dr. Nkenga Song, if I can then come to you. Um, Minister Hart indicated a few moments ago um, that regulation and more uniformity in terms of how we approach the pharmaceutical question um, is a challenge indeed. What is some of the, what have been some of the stumbling blocks that are being encountered and how do we begin to address those without necessarily trying to apply a one size fits all philosophy? I think as a continent, our um... A pathway to that addressing that challenge is uh, to rally behind the African Medicine Agency, the AMA, which the African Union is actively uh, pushing forward. And it needs to be supported and it needs to be uh, uh, capacitated. I think without such a body that uh, works very closely with the uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, some of the ambitions and aspirations that we are discussing here will be challenged. 
And we, we can also, uh, as the minister said, uh, Minister from uh, Amadou from Senegal said, also look at regionalizing those approaches. We are a large continent. The AU covers 55 member states, but they are regional blocks. And I mean, if you look uh, around those regulatory processes within the regions and they fit into the overall continental structure, that would be the pathway which I think uh, will facilitate our ability to uh, do that. We do not have a choice though, because the continental free trade agreement will not be um, uh, efficient if we would not adhere and begin to yield some of away some of our sovereignty in making those uh, important decisions. I mean, it has to be a give and take. We cannot have, uh, want to have a cake and then eat uh, uh, at the same time eat a cake. So um, the African Medicine Agency will be a vital instrument for a lot of the discussions that we are having around uh, manufacturing and moving the continent forward. In his remarks, uh, Dr. Kim said one of the things that was important that had helped in many instances was the question of paying community work, uh, health workers to assist. In other words, taking uh, the, the challenge and the solution closer to the ground. Another element of that same argument would be including and incorporating the public as a stakeholder in trying to identify and, and, and find those solutions. How difficult or how easy is that? How, how does one go about making sure that on the ground, the health workers are, are helping carry some of that load, but that we as Joe Public are also informed enough to also share some of that load? No, the health care workers uh, or community workers, uh, to me, have played a very critical role, uh, especially in this pandemic. We at Africa CDC were able to deploy about 17,000 uh, uh, community healthcare workers uh, in several countries in Africa during the early phase of the, um, the pandemic uh, to assist with contact tracing, uh, uh, isolation of patients and other works. And we continue to believe that they will play a critical role going forward when uh, vaccines uh, start uh, arriving in the continent at scale, which uh, of course they will be uh, would, uh, very critical in helping in the scale up in the community. So I think that is key. But before this crisis, Community workers were also and have always been critical in an HIV pandemic. We should always remember that we still have a pandemic too, that is uh, has been overshadowed by by the uh, the, the COVID nineteen. So the, there's a lot of lessons that need to be learned there. If you recall, in 2017, our head of state during the assembly, the um, head of state summit in Addis Ababa, the head of state committed themselves to uh, mobilizing two million community healthcare workers across the continent to support HIV, uh, TB, and malaria program. We really need to do a couple of things. We need to incentivize that process. We need to recognize the important role that they play. Uh, I always argue that community healthcare workers are the nexus between universal health coverage and our health security. It starts in the community, it ends in the community. And those who are closer to it are uh, the community workers that can help us translate those messages there. It's not somebody like me sitting in the uh, headquarters in Addis Ababa that goes into the communities in my native Cameroon to tell them to believe in me. It is the, their own peers that will do that and make them believe in themselves. But we need to really consider that as a critical component of our fight against um, uh, 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 outbreaks and also regular endemic diseases there. I think that the very last thing is really incorporate them into our system. We can't be that the community healthcare workers are people that we mobilize, use them to respond to outbreaks and then uh, uh, abandon them there. They should really be part of uh, uh, our health system as, as, a, as a whole. There are a number of stakeholders that one can look at in this entire value chain, if you will, um, from from the, the 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 patients, us Joe Public, ourselves, all the way up to policymakers. James, if if one were to look at some of the lessons that you have learned in trying to map out how to allocate, if I may, responsibility to the various stakeholders in that chain to ensure that everybody's pushing forward. Because obviously it can't all be left to the policymakers or to the funders or to the community or to, it, it's, it's a multi-pronged strategy, but everything has to kind of move in tandem. How, how do you make that happen? Of course, um, I, I'll give the examples of how, as the IDP group, the Latin America private, the, the Latin America Development Bank addressed these issues, and hopefully this can be uh, useful to the governors and to the bank. Um, 
we came together as a group uh, to talk about what the impact has been, is being, and will be of the pandemic over Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, we feel, and the statistics shows, that this is a region that has been vastly impacted by not only the contagious rate, but also the mortality rate that we've had. So uh, we feel that it, it has had a, a devastating effect. And that's when, at the beginning of all this, the group came together and did a, a strategy based on how the IDB group will react to the health crisis. We can talk about the economic crisis, but the health crisis that all our countries were living. And there was a division of labor done between what the public sector arm would be doing by financing, injecting, creating a guarantees for governments to be able to access vaccines. But there was a big role being played by us, the private sector, in injecting financing to a number of different areas. And let me give a few examples to give a, to give a sense of this. One, one of the, the cities that was, one of the countries, but in particular, one of the cities that was most impacted by the virus was the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And we did a big financing to one of the largest hospitals that's called Albert Einstein for them to be able to expand their IC units triple fold. And we did it very, very fast. It was a facility that we required from the board in which we could act very quickly to finance hospitals, many of them private, some of them public, to finance a hospital for the expansion of the IC units. So one area, one vector of work was physical infrastructure. Hmm? Yeah. Another area of work is preparing the companies to be able to restart their businesses. And a lot of the injection of capital that we've had, not only to the pharmaceutical companies, where we've done quite a bit, but also to the private companies, is preparing their facilities to open up in a very safe place. So I would say that the strategy, the biggest ingredient is a strategy that cuts across the condemning of the public and private sector, but also a key role of investing in innovative solutions, sometimes risk-taking solutions, but very developmentally oriented solutions that can be provided by the private sector. James, thank you very much. We're rapidly running out of time, just as it gets exciting and interesting. But uh, Minister Hart, I'm going to come to you to, to, to give us um, your thoughts as we, as we wrap up. It's, it's been mentioned um, in particular by Mr. Ofoa from Ghana, the question of illicit flows and ensuring that that money stays in the continent in order to invest. How doable is that going to be? Sorry, can you repeat the question, sorry? So the question of illicit flows, um, Mr. Ofoa from Ghana had indicated that we need to put a lid on illicit flows out of the continent in order to make sure that those funds stay here and we can invest them back into sectors such as the pharmaceutical sector. Um, is that going to be doable? You know, ab absolutely doable. It, uh, it depends on a couple of uh, fields. Number one is the efforts that our governments would have to do on the ground. And number two, what the international community also would have to do also uh, at their level. We, a lot of work is being done with OECD uh, at the African Union level as well. And uh, one of the initiatives, for example, that uh, uh, we can have is really to harmonize, for example, our tax policies when it comes to natural resources, where, whether it's in the mining sector or in the oil and gas sector, to really uh, harmonize our, our let's say, uh, policies and make sure that, let's say, each African country is signing let's say, the best conventions, the best investment agreements to make sure, for example, uh, we are fighting, let's say, uh, uh, transfer pricing. If you look at, let's say, the, nat the natural resources sector, many multinationals have, let's say, systems where the profits are captured outside of Africa, for example. And that is a major issue. But what I think uh, the G7, let's say, validated the other day in terms of having a minimal let's say, tax rate uh, for the multinationals. It should have a good impact 
uh, on our on our countries. But the work, the majority of the work, has to be done locally, uh, strengthening our tax inspectors' uh, skills, uh, uh, strengthening as well our custom skills to make sure that when a company uh, present costs to us that will be deducted from their profits, that those costs are reasonable, that it's not uh, something that is done just to capture uh, profits overseas and uh, uh, make us, let's say, uh, not pay, uh, not receive the tax on the ground. So those are some of the things that we should push, let's say, forward so that uh, we can fight one part of the uh, illicit uh, uh, flows of capital, especially outside Africa. Thank you. Mr. Hart, you can reprimand me later for giving you little time to answer a huge question, but nonetheless, thank you so very much for trying. Dr. Nkenga Song, to you, thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, James Scriven, to you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dennis uh, Destina, now we're going to come to you to try to wrap up this really interesting conversation. It sounds like it's got many facets, but you're really great at doing the key takeaways. So we're going to hand over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tumi. As always, uh, always a delight to have you moderate the sessions for us. Um, you know, it was great to have you all, and thank you very much uh, to Dr. Kim. I think uh, the key point I want to say is that we must learn from experience. Uh, clearly, uh, we had it also from Dr. Uh, the director of CDC. We have to learn from that. We must be able to say never again. You know, how many times do we have to keep learning? They say history repeats itself the second time because we didn't learn the first time. So we can't just continue to learn. We must give Africa the healthcare defense system that it absolutely needs. We hear that uh, it's very important to build uh, Africa's manufacturing capacity. Yes, but as we do that, we need to make sure that we are building the plant level uh, 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 quality, making sure that we have the skilled people to do that, making sure that we are also paying attention to infrastructure, because not just the, uh, the, the plant capacity, but the logistics to distribute quality and safe pharmaceutical products it also needs to be uh, very well uh, 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 done. And so that also the pharmaceutical companies locally can meet the WHO standards. Uh, otherwise, in terms of procurement, that becomes uh, a problem. Uh, we hear a lot about the importance of also building uh, uh, healthcare infrastructure. You know, I just want to share in a minute, you know, when I, when I used to live in India, uh, when I started my international career, I stayed from the U.S. I, I live in a state called Hyderabad. And I went and I saw hospitals there. I was amazed the kind of hospitals they had. And I didn't know where they were able to get all these monies to do this. And a few years ago, when we had the annual meetings of the African Development Bank in India, and I had the opportunity to uh, meet with Prime Minister Modi, I asked him, Mr. Prime Minister, this is what I experienced there. What happened? How are you able to do that? because somebody was talking about diaspora. I think you were talking about it to me. And, and somebody, and he said, what we did was simple. We simply had so many doctors outside, physicians outside, nurses and technicians. And we asked them that they can come back to India, invest their money tax-free, take their monies out. And that is how we find top-notch infrastructure today in the healthcare sector for India. And so the whole issue of incentives that the ministers were talking about, it's very, very important. And he said to me, well, we were not looking for money. We just wanted the infrastructure to be there. So the diaspora of Africa must be supported. Africa has so many thousands and thousands of its medical uh, personnel outside of Africa. Just because the infrastructure is so poor, they don't want to work here. So we need to connect them back and have financing facilities that allows us to tap our best minds in the diaspora and bring them back into Africa. We have the importance of partnerships, yes, the African Development Bank was very delighted to have WHO and Africa CDC and others and the, uh, and the Inter-American Development Bank partnerships at all levels, public, private, institutional, multilateral and bilateral is going to be uh, very, very important. Uh, we also had the importance of making sure that we have greater financing uh, for the health sector. We are not investing enough in health. And I think the ministers and the governors were very clear that this is very, very important. The regulatory environment and the safety. I lost my brother at the age of 31 because he simply was trying, he went to a hospital and it, all he had was malaria, nothing more. They tried to give him an, uh, an IV. They did it. Within five seconds, he was dead. And the reason was because the IV they gave him had lead in it. And you can imagine how many people die because of fake drugs 
across Africa. So I think the point that was raised about the regulatory environment, the safety, the manufacturing process, and also the control of the, I mean, the, the strengthening the national regulatory agencies, it's very, very critical. In addition, of course, to the Africa uh, Medicine Agency that we all talk about. The importance of digitalization, infrastructure for health doesn't have to be brick and mortar alone. Today, you can have e-health. We have uh, one of the people that participated in our panel was Dr. Fumi Adefara. Adewa. She runs what's called Mobi Health. They connect doctors from around the world. They connect uh, pharmacies from around the world. You pay maybe $20 a year and you get access to every single thing. This is a digital world. We must take advantage of that. Now, we also had the importance of policy, evidence-based policy decisions. And this is very, very important. And for banks like ourselves, as a knowledge institution, we can help working with WHO and others to look at what works, what doesn't work, and to be able to have best practices that can actually be, be replicated. So the, the whole of knowledge, I think it's very, very important. Now, we also have to realize that the finance matters. And I think that was the, the point that you were just, just saying with Minister Amadou and others, that the finance, PPPs have to play a big role here, not just public sector. Private sector have to play a big role. The pension funds, as I said uh, uh, two days ago, we can't just be investing our pension funds outside the continent and then have a continent that has the kind of appalling healthcare infrastructure that we have. Of what use is a pension fund that you have to come back to a place where you don't have good infrastructure and then have annuity for the rest of your life to live in a place with crummy healthcare infrastructure. That's not a good use. And I really think it's time for us to really work with Africa pension funds and sovereign wealth funds to prioritize infrastructure. And in this particular case, to prioritize investment in the area of quality healthcare infrastructure. We also have to, uh, as we look at the issue of regional hubs, we have that conversation there. Very, very important for economies of scale, also transfer of skills, also uh, uh, infrastructure. It's very, very important to do that. And I think, as uh, was said, the Africa continental free trade area offers an enormous opportunities for that. And we must make sure that we have economies of scale because scale matters. When you're talking farmer, you must have scale. And we can only have that when we take advantage of the economic uh, uh, opportunities in the Africa continental free trade area. Technology transfer is critical. We must therefore make sure that we are transferring technology. Recently, we had the uh, old issue of the trade-related intellectual property rights with regard to this added WTO. Yes, even if you had that, you still have to have the technology, uh, the, 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 the trade secrets, there are all kinds of things that makes it impossible for you to be able to produce pharmaceutical products. And when I was uh, in Rockefeller Foundation in the 90s, uh, we worked, we had a similar problem. If plants can talk, they will tell you the plants we had diseases, viruses that were going to wipe out all of Africa's bananas, all of Africa's cassava. And we had to actually work to leverage technology and IP from the global holders of those technologies by setting up what's called the African Technology Transfer Foundation. It's right there in Nairobi. That's why we were able to get access to proprietary technologies that allows us to com uh, 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 incorporate draw tolerance into ways to be able to have virus resistant bananas that is making it easier for everybody in Rwanda, for across East Africa to eat bananas today. Otherwise, we will have disappeared. So we do need an intermediacy agency to intermediate with regard to access to IP and the management of IP in a very, very transparent way. Otherwise, we will not be able to succeed. And just to close, I like very much what Anne-Marie said at the beginning. She said it's not just building back better, it's building back healthier. And to be able to build back healthier, Jim Kim told us we have to combine infrastructure that we do, the roads and things like that, with healthcare infrastructure. After all, of what use is it building roads that carry sick and probably dead people? Thank you very much for a very, very uh, great conversation. For us as a bank, we'll also take uh, away from us. We will be selective, of course. We will look at areas of comparative advantage, and we will look at complementarity uh, with other players. as a World Bank, as ourselves, as IFC, there's Inter-American Development Bank, there is the Africa CDC and the WHO. 
We will work in partnership, but we must build this infrastructure for Africa because all life matters. Thank you very much. It's great to see you. Merci. Thank you so much, President Adeshina. Absolutely, all life matters. Isn't that a brilliant way to wrap up the day that we had today with so many stimulating discussions together, just like President uh, Adeshina and all our esteemed guests today said, together we can build healthcare systems and infrastructures that our continent deserves. And indeed, it will certainly help our young people and our health professionals stay at home. Well, this brings us to the end of this knowledge event on building Africa's healthcare defense system, part of the African Development Bank's annual meetings. Thank you all for joining, and it has been a pleasure to be your host today. For now, it's au revoir, goodbye. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will be um, announcing some housekeeping. Um, in the next session, we will begin the third sitting. And the third sitting will be at 